morning and welcome to our Sunday service. Merry Christmas to you. We're so glad that you could join us. We've been looking at a series called Born is the King of Israel, and today we'll be looking at the worshiped king. If you're wanting to sing some Christmas carols, there is a playlist and you can click on that or just continue rolling. I want to thank you also for your faithfulness in giving. A number have dropped off your offering at the church or use the e-transfer option. Well, let's look together at the worship king, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We have saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So Heavenly Father, as we bow our hearts and heads before you, at this Sunday before Christmas. We pray that our hearts will be full of worship and wonder and adoration as we look at you, the worshiped King. So be glorified, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the old carol beckons us, come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. Well, I know 2020 has been a difficult year. It's been challenging in many ways. But before you're tempted to throw up your hands in despair and say, I would love to come and worship, but the present health order prevents me from doing so. It might be good to remind ourselves that worship is more than just gathering together for a church service. Rather, it's an attitude of the heart which declares our intention to honor and to serve the Lord with our entire being. Years ago, Marguerite was visiting with her grandmother, and Sunday came, and she said, Grandma, are we going to church today? But the car didn't work, and so they couldn't go. So Grandma, she began to sing some songs, and they sang together, and she read from the Bible. And then she looked at her granddaughter and said this, there are days where you just won't be able to get to church but make sure you always sing his praises and read his word. Now, I understand how disappointing and heartbreaking it is to once again be asked to refrain from spending time with our families during Christmas or from gathering together for things like our candlelight Christmas Eve service, which, by the way, we will be putting on our website and YouTube channel. And so check that just before supper, Christmas Eve. I, I hope it will be an encouragement to you. But I really hope that these restrictions do not rob you of the opportunity to worship Jesus, the newborn king within the confines of, of your home, your living room, your kitchen. We can worship him even there. Remember, we're not the first generation that has experienced upheaval or been asked to sacrifice for the good of others. During World War II, William Temple was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And I want you to listen to what he says about worship. He says, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purposes of God. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love to gather with many brothers and sisters and worship the Lord together in our sanctuary. But I am grateful for technology that allows us to do what we're doing this morning. However, I believe that this present health order does not prevent us from worshiping the Lord in the manner that William Temple described. I look at the Christmas story, and I notice how God is worshiped in a variety of places. Old Simeon worshiped him in the temple. Elizabeth worshiped in her front yard along with Mary as, as, as the baby within her womb leapt for joy. And then Mary she responded with praise right there as well. Zechariah worshiped in their home after his voice returned to him. The angels, they worshiped in the fields outside of Bethlehem uh, along with some startled shepherds who, by the way, went to see baby Jesus in the manger and, and they were so excited by what they saw at the stable that they glorified and praised God as they walked the streets of Bethlehem on the way back to their fields. 
So I, I think, yes, there's the possibility that the restrictions could rob us of our joy. However, I hope that we would be more like the angels who could hardly contain themselves when suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. But perhaps the most intriguing worshiper in the Christmas story are those wise men who traveled a great distance to worship the one who was born king of Israel. So let's take a look at their journey. The first thing we see is a pursuit for God. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the one who has been born? King of the Jews, we've saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When the Magi saw the star, they were convinced that it was his star. And because of that, they set out to find this child. They had great uh, expectation that they would find him as well. Now, some might have thought they were silly. Some thought maybe they were needlessly wasting their time and resources. But they believed that the pursuit of this one was worthy, worthy of their time, worthy of their, wor uh, of their resources because he was worthy of worship. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Now, isn't that exactly what the wise men did? Didn't they believe that he was born, that he existed? Didn't they believe that, that he would reward those who earnestly sought him? Now, there's a lot of speculation about these wise men, and the scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about them. But the fact that King Herod welcomed them into the palace for a, a meal would indicate that they probably arrived in Jerusalem with a level of wealth and nobility that few others would possess. According to tradition, there was three of them. Gaspar, the king of India, Malchor, the king of Persia, and Balthazar, the king of Arabia. And that's probably where uh, the author of We Three Kings got his inspiration. However, most, most modern scholars wonder if they were similar to the wise men that we read about in the book of Daniel. Men who studied the stars in an effort to interpret the signs in the sky, and then they would give advice to the king about his future or about events that were happening. They were also known as magicians or enchanters or astrologers. So when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had trouble with a dream that he had that night, he turned to his wise men for help. But instead of telling them what he had dreamed and, and they give the interpretation, he basically demanded that they tell him what he dreamed and then what it means. We read this in Daniel chapter 2, verse 11. The wise men respond, what the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. Now included in their number were four men that had been taken from the captivity from Israel into Babylon, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were captives that were chosen because they were so uh, wise. They were chosen to be wise men along with all these others. And when they learned of the decree, Daniel said, can we at least have some time that we might seek our God and find an interpretation to this dream? Well, it was granted to them, and the four spent the entire night in prayer, desperate, crying out to God that he would show them what the king had dreamed and what it meant. And God graciously revealed the dream to them, and Nebuchadnezzar was thrilled we read that in Daniel 2, verse 47. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. 
for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. And he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Well, this is exciting. And it is significant because it means that it was very possible that Daniel was the one who had alerted these magi, these wise men, to look for the signs. They loved to look for the signs in the night sky, but that they would look for the sign of the prophecy. That old prophecy made by another Gentile named Balaam, who kings sought for his advice, just like they did for these wise men. And here's his prophecy. It's found in the book of Numbers, verse 24, or chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. Now, it's possible now that this prophecy was handed down from generation to generation until 600 years later. These wise men saw the star and recognized that it was his star, that it was significant because it was the fulfillment of this prophecy. Well, the Jewish scholars, they understood and they knew the prophecy as well, but somehow they missed it. Perhaps they were preoccupied with all the logistics required to facilitate a a Roman census. Maybe they were managing the people's frustrations. I mean, who likes taxation time? You know, in our world, we've had a most unusual year. It seems that every community around the globe has been impacted by COVID-19 in some way. And like those in ancient Israel, We're processing the feelings of frustration and the feelings of loss. We're having to adjust our Christmas plans and and try to figure out how to celebrate the holidays in, in a brand new way. But I hope our frustrations don't get the best of us. I hope that they don't rob us of our peace and our joy, the peace and joy that Jesus brings to those who are willing to come to him and believe like the shepherds did that night in Bethlehem, or like the wise men did as they set out to follow the star. Jeremiah, he says this, and it's God speaking through him. He says, you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. So I trust and I pray this Christmas season that you will take time to seek the face of God, that you will take time to spend in prayer, to simply love and and adore and to appreciate all that Jesus has done. The saying's true. Wise men still seek him. The second thing we see in these wise men is a desire to give. We see that in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. Then they opened their gifts of gold and incense, and of myrrh. One of my favorite Christmas memories, and maybe even one of my earliest Christmas memories, was going to the Army and Navy with my aunt. We were going to pick out a gift from my mom and my dad. Now, I couldn't have been very old, and I'm not even sure where I got the money from, but I do remember picking out a Parker pen. I knew it would be perfect gift for my dad for Christmas. Now, I don't remember what I got that Christmas, and I don't even remember anything else about that Christmas. But for whatever reason, that moment stands out and is stuck in my heart and my mind. Maybe it's a reminder of how natural it is to give to those who we really care about. And that, of course, includes giving to the Lord. Now, when the Magi saw the star, they understood its significance. And that immediately created a a quandary for them. They had a decision to make. Would they seek him or would they admire him from afar? And if they did go on the journey, were they willing to bear the expense of that journey, both in time and resources? After all, he wasn't their king. He was the king of the Jews. And yet they were willing to travel a great distance to worship him. 
They must have sensed that this newborn king was actually the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But they didn't come to petition him. They didn't come to make some great request. They simply came to worship. They bowed in humble reverence, and then they presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. No one asked them to do this. And I doubt that Mary and Joseph charged an admission and said, well, you can see the child if you just bring a gift. No, they just came. And they brought these gifts. And they were gifts of of adoration given from men whose hearts were full of wonder at the sight of this newborn king. Sometimes I I get concerned because I think sometimes we approach Jesus much like a child approaches Santa Claus. And even though there's a great sense of wonder and mystery about who this person is, the conversation quickly moves to what I want and what I desire. I might even give all the reasons why I deserve that very thing. And I realize that God has told us that we can bring our requests, Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving Present your request to God. But there's something inspiring about the fact that the wise men simply came to adore. No other reason, just to give and to love. And I hope and I pray that at this Christmas season that we will do the same, that we will ponder the wonders of the one who came to be our Savior and Lord. And that we will determine in our hearts that we will respond to him by giving him our heart. In the Christmas carol, in the bleak midwinter, a question is asked. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I I would bring him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. What can I give him? I will give him my heart. And I wonder today, have you responded to Jesus? Have you given him your heart? I think we could right now if if you haven't. I invite you to pray with me. You can pray a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I thank you for coming to earth to be my Savior. Thank you for going to the cross to die for my sin, for rising again to bring me new life. Today, I give you my heart. Please wash it and cleanse it, and fill it with your peace and your presence. I want to serve you, and I want to make you my king and my Lord. Amen. See, if you pray to prayer like that, then you have become a follower of Christ. It's important to get a Bible and maybe talk to somebody that that knows Jesus, that can help you understand more about the Bible and more about him. You can talk to a Christian friend or, or maybe even talk to us. We'd be happy to pray with you. And hopefully it will fill you with the third point, and that's joy. Matthew 2, verse 10 says, When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Well, it seems that somewhere along the way, the star disappeared. Now, I heard a cute sketch of, of some um, children playing this role of wise men, and they were saying that somebody was supposed to watch for the star, and it was all his fault. Well, in this moment when they lost the star, I guess they could have packed up their tents. They could have went and returned home. However, they continued to proceed in the direction of the last location of the star, and that led them to Jerusalem, which unfortunately caused King Herod some anxiety, as we saw last week. Look at verse 4. And when he had called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, Herod asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they reply. I find it interesting how King Herod kind of put two and two together and figured out that this king who was born, king of the Jews, had to be the Messiah. And so he appealed to the scriptures to get the answer that they were looking for. Now, clearly, it was a mistake on the wise man's part to to go to King Herod's palace, but it made sense, I guess, in the natural. But unfortunately, it ended up costing these baby boys, age two and under in Bethlehem, their lives. 
for King Herod was determined to kill the newborn king. But thankfully, God was able to redeem the situation. He warned Joseph in a dream to flee to Egypt before Herod could get his hands on the baby Jesus. And I wonder how often we mistakenly follow our own wisdom because the path ahead of us was maybe unclear or, or maybe more difficult than we had first anticipated. And before we know it, we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe we're even causing pain to those that are around us. But you know, we serve a God that for, can forgive and he can redeem our mistakes and he can work things out for his glory. I'm amazed how often God uses the word of God to get us back on track. Like he used that prophecy from the book of Micah to help the wise men see, oh, we need to be in Bethlehem. And so it's important that we take time to read the Bible on a consistent basis and let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Well, after they got that prophecy from Micah 5 and head off to Bethlehem, the star again appears. And they're, they're thrilled. They're overjoyed. They're, we are on the right track. This is exciting for us. But you know, it's not the first time someone was full of joy in the Christmas story. Mention Elizabeth before. Her baby leapt for joy when, when, he, when she heard Mary's greeting. And the angels, of course, they announced good news of great joy to the shepherds. <laughs> Their excitement was that Jesus had come. Their excitement was that salvation was possible for humanity, that the lost could be found, that the hurting could be healed. And those who were full of shame, well, they could be forgiven and restored. Jesus alludes to this excitement in heaven when he tells the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and, and the lost son. In, in all three cases, the shepherd and the woman and the father, they invite others to join with them, to celebrate in their joy because the lost had been found. Jesus said in Luke 15, verse 10, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And maybe that's why Isaiah could say it's with joy that you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And so our worship includes a pursuit of God, a heart to give, a joyful spirit, but also a willingness to obey. We find that in verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now remember, these are Gentile men with a background that some might consider, well, questionable. And yet God chose to use them. They were able to bless Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. Their gifts probably provided the necessary funds that they needed to, to flee to Egypt and set up a home there. But God also spoke to them. He spoke to them in a dream that night, and, and they were willing to obey. And that gave Joseph and Mary and Jesus enough time to depart from Bethlehem before Herod's men could arrive. You know, Jesus once said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. We obey. We obey not because we have to. We obey because we choose to, because we delight in obeying, because we trust God's leading. We want to bring him glory. We want to please and honor him. And so we choose then to obey, which again is, is an act of worship. Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn king. And should we wonder what's involved in that as we heed the carols, encouragement to us? The wise men have provided us at least a very good place to start. Worship means I'll take time to pursue Jesus. For some, that will involve a, a time of a prayer and Bible reading first thing in the morning. For others, it will involve a time of praise and, and, and meditation in the evening. 
But the important thing is we're taking time for Jesus each and every day. And we demonstrate our love and devotion through our giving, both through our time and, and our resources. And of course, that's done with a joyful heart that rejoices in all that God has done. And we recognize his blessing on us and we realize we just can't even give back a portion of that which has been entrusted to us and given to us by faith. And lastly, our worship includes a willingness to trust Jesus and do whatever he asks. And so I pray that each of us will take some time between now and Christmas to just pause and think and meditate and to adore, to worship the Lord and have him glorified in your heart. Heavenly Father, we pray now as we, as we pause that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, but that you would again fill our hearts with wonder and adoration. And Lord, that we would want to worship the newborn king as well. So, be with each person now in Jesus' precious name. Let us have a wonderful Christmas. And may your presence be with us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. And I do wish you a very Merry Christmas.